Thanks for joining us on Facebook Live. We're going to gather as a family here shortly. And uh, my sisters who have way more friends than I will post this and hopefully you all can watch and uh, give thanks to God for Diane. I appreciate you watching and we love you all. Welcome to the name of Jesus, the Savior of the world. We gather to worship, to proclaim Christ crucified and risen, to remember before God our beloved Diane, to give thanks for her life, to commend her to our merciful Redeemer, and to comfort one another in our grief. We gather in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, I'm, I'll ask the family to place a pall in Diane's casket. And it's a baptismal symbol to remind us of the promises that God gives us in, in holy baptism. And if you will do that, we'll just unfurl it. It's a little like tucking your mom in. She used to tuck you in and you can tuck her in. The baptism God gives God's self to us completely as Father. He withholds absolutely nothing as Son. He comes to us without ceasing as Holy Spirit. And so we have this promise that we belong to God. And there isn't anything that can even put a dent in that. And not even a death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. All who are baptized in Christ and put on Christ. In her baptism, Diana is clothed with Christ. In the day of Christ's coming, she will be clothed in glory. I invite you all to join me in the acclamation. The eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, who formed us from the dust of the earth, who by your breath gave us life, we glorify you. Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, who suffered death for all of humanity, who rose from the grave to open the way to eternal life, we praise you, Holy Spirit, author and giver of life, the comforter of all who sorrow, our sure confidence and everlasting hope. We worship you. We sing together. Amazing grace. <laughs>
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Also with you. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we remember before you today our sister Diane. We thank you for giving her to us to know and love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. Hear boundless compassion, console us to mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we may live in confidence and hope until we are gathered to our heavenly homes in the company of all your saints, through Jesus our Savior. Amen. I'll ask Jim to come and read our scriptures today. with a word of thanks uh, to many. Uh, first of all, last night's visitation, uh, you're all very exhausting. <laughs> in a very good way. Uh, I cannot believe the turnout last night and the pouring out of love, and we all felt it. And we so much appreciate it. We would like to do it again tonight, if that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding, I don't think I could take it. I don't think my siblings could either. Uh, a word of thanks. Thank you, Pastor Paul, for loving my mom. Thank you for sharing God's word with her and his body and blood with her through communion. Thank you, Pastor, for reminding her that she was and she is special to this world and she is special to Jesus Christ. I want to thank the staff and the congregations of St. John Lutheran Church, where we are seated today, and Jasper ELC for the ways you, you all have ministered to my mother, Diane, over the years. And a special thank you to Pastor Sue for caring for your sister in Christ the way you have. All right, medical personnel. To the EMTs in Jasper and Brandon, to the emergency room personnel at Sanford, and the staff at Sunrise Village who served Mom, thank you. You were there morning, noon, and dark of night during Mom's last years. You gave all of us more time with our mother, and for that, we are grateful to all of you. To the entire staff and skilled caregivers at Bethany Lutheran Home in Brandon, you are part of our family whether you like it or not. <laughs> you cared for Diane, in ways her children could not, or in my case, would not. <laughs> but because of your gifts, your skill, and your ministry of life, you were, we were able to enjoy our mother a year and a half longer than any of us anticipated. My mother rarely bossed me around, but the last command she gave me was, get Chris, get Sadie, bring Chris and Sadie to me now. These two caregivers at Bethany were on top, or top of mind for my mother because they were care and love each and every day. Chris and Sadie are just two of many, many people who cared for my mother in wonderful ways, and they showed that love and compassion day after day after day. To Avera at Home Hospice, especially Kim and Karen, and there are others. You cared, you comforted, and you guided Diane and her children with such grace, peace, and understanding. You helped make Mom's spiritual transition into the arms of Jesus Christ as, comfort, as comfortable for her as possible, and you educated us along the way, and we're so patient and kind. To Darren Corcoran, our go-to guy at Heritage Funeral Home, I never thought our friendship would pay any dividends at all. But you proved me wrong. I am thankful, we are thankful, for you being so professional, so positive, and even a little bit funny. I told him the other day that he puts fun in funeral. I'm not sure he appreciated that or not. Um, and Darren, thank you for giving me your cell phone so I could call you so you could contact me over and over and over. We've gotten to be even better friends, and I'm grateful for that. 
But all, everyone at Heritage Funeral Home made this process, this difficult process, much lighter. And I thank you for caring for us the way you care for your own. I want to thank the wives, the husbands, the children, and the grandchildren, the friends and co-workers of Diane's six children. You were patient, understanding, and loving during our recent time away with Mom. And you were patient with the many late-night emergency runs we have made to meet an ambulance or to shuttle Diane to another doctor's appointment. I fear we have taken advantage of you, and for that, I apologize. But thank you for helping us, making it possible for us to care for our mother. And finally, thank you to my sisters and my brother, Donna, Sandra, Mary, Bobby, and Tina. We held a memorable vigil the last 20 days of my mom's life here on Earth, a sacred time I will never forget. I love you all. The love you all showed Mama, Mother, Mumsy, Mom. That love didn't start on February 23rd when Mom started receiving elevated uh, pain relief. It started years ago when we were all very small. And none of us, none of us loved Mom because of what she could do for us. We loved her because she first loved us. And that's exactly how we respond to God. We don't love him because of what we can get from God. We love him because he first loved us. And because he loves us, he gave us two indescribable blessings. Diane Clark Erickson Spear as our mother, and Jesus Christ, God's only son, as mom's savior, and he is ours too. Thank you for letting me do that, and now we're going to get to the part that matters, the word of God. Um, over the past 20 days, we've had wonderful opportunity to share God's word with our mother. And uh, every time I was in there, I tried to find something that would be pertinent to what was happening in her life and in ours. And on uh, March 12th, which was last Saturday, um, we read Psalm 71 to Diane. Here's Psalm 71. I want you to think of Diane in the bed, unable to respond. And I also want you to think of Jesus Christ on the cross when you hear these words. O Lord, you are my refuge. Never let me be disgraced. Rescue me. Save me from my enemies, for you are just. Turn your ear to listen and set me free. Be to me a protecting rock of safety where I am always welcome. Give the order to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. O Lord, you alone are my hope. I trusted you, O Lord, from childhood. Yes, you have been with me from birth. From my mother's womb, you have cared for me. No wonder I am always praising you. My life is an example to many, because you have been my strength and my protection. That is why I can never stop praising you. I declare your glory all day long. And now, in my old age, don't set me aside. Don't abandon me when my strength is failing. Oh God, don't stay away. My God, please hurry to help me. I will keep on hoping for you to help me. I will praise you more and more. I will tell everyone about your righteousness. All day long, I will proclaim your saving power, for I am overwhelmed by how much you have done for me. I will praise your mighty deeds, O Sovereign Lord. I will tell everyone that you alone are just and good. O God, you have taught me from my earliest childhood, and I have constantly told others about the wonderful things you do. Listen to this one. Now that I am old and gray, do not abandon me, O God. Let me proclaim your power to this new generation, your mighty, mighty miracles to all who come after me. Your righteousness, O God, reaches to the highest heavens. You have done such wonderful things. Who can compare with you, O God? The answer is no one. You have allowed me to suffer much hardship, but you will restore me to life again and lift me up from the depths of the earth. You will restore me to even greater honor and comfort me once again. I will shout for joy and sing your praises, for you have redeemed me. I will tell about your righteous deeds all day long. Amen. Second reading. 
Bob knows I can go on and on. The second reading uh, was read to mom six hours before she died. I happened to be uh, with mom in her room by myself, and I was just paging through looking for something that would be pertinent. Lord, give me something to say to her. I don't know if she can hear me, but give me something. And he brought me to Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 18. What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will give us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, everything on earth was subjected to God's curse. All creation anticipates the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And even we Christians, although we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, we also groan to be released from pain and suffering. We too wait anxiously for that day when God will give us our full rights as his children, including the new bodies he has promised us. Now that we are saved, we eagerly look forward to this freedom. For if you already have something, you don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't have yet, we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our distress, for we don't know what we should pray for nor how we should pray. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit leads, the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. For God knew His people in advance, and He chose them to become like His Son, so that his son would be the firstborn with many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And he gave them right standing with himself, and he promised them his glory. What can we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for all of us, won't God, who gave us Christ, also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own will? Will God accuse us? No. He is the one who has given us right standing with himself. Oh, wait. <laughs> it's my distraction. I mean. He is the one who has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? Will Christ Jesus? No. For he is the one who died for us and was raised to life for us and is sitting at the place of highest honor next to God, where Diane is, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or cold or in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ, who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from that love. Death can't, and life can't. The angels can't, and the demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, and even the powers of hell can't keep God's love away. Whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. one more. And this is the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. John 14, 1 through 6. Jesus said, Don't be troubled. You trust God, now trust in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house, and I'm going to, pre and I'm going to prepare a place for you. If this were not so, I would tell you plainly. When everything is ready, I will come and I will get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know where I am going and how to get there. But Thomas said, no, Lord, we don't know. We haven't any idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. 
The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus. Amen. I want to start by telling you how grateful I am personally for your mumsy. <laughs> to whom was she mumsy? I would think he yeah, was wonderful. Very grateful for your Diane. Her unconditional care and her empathy was immediate and it never failed and always made me feel welcome. Uh, whenever I came into the room with her, I felt welcome as I heard from so many of you. You said she made us feel like family, which is a big deal. It's a big deal for me because I'm a pastor. Uh, I'm the village holy man. We talked about this the other, the other day. The village holy man, which means I'm a bit of a social pariah. Nobody really knows what to do with me. You know, you wear a clerical collar onto an elevator, and uh, it is just as silent as a tomb. When the door is closed, they don't know what to do. Uh, I mentioned this is why I get a haircut so infrequently, because the first thing they always ask you when you sit in the chair is, you know, what will you do? And I usually lie, uh, because if I tell them the truth, then they get all what to say and then I get a really bad haircut <laughs> and that's the second loneliest hour of my life <laughs> the loneliest hour of my life is just after wedding receptions you know when you go to find a table to sit at nobody wants you <laughs> <laughs> so I am very very grateful for your mom very, very grateful. I want to start with a little wisdom here today. Uh, because I've been thinking a lot about how it was that Diane could be so empathetic and so loving and so welcoming of everybody who came into the room. And so a little wisdom for you. How did she do this? Here's some wisdom from Clay Vincent. Uh, he is the commissioner of baseball from 1989 to 1992. Um, I am not sharing this with you because Diane liked baseball necessarily. I don't know really if she did, but she loved life. And this is about life, baseball and life. This is what uh, Vincent writes. Baseball teaches us, or has taught a lot of us anyway, how to deal with failure. We learn at a very young age that failure is norm, the norm in baseball. Precisely because we fail, we hold in high regard those who fail less often. We still fail. He said, he writes this, I also find it fascinating that baseball, alone in sport, considers errors to be a part of the game, part of its rigorous truth. I wanted to start with this guy, uh, not because Diane liked baseball, but because she loved life. And she knew this about life. Life is full of errors. It's like baseball. Errors are just part of the game and perfection as a goal for any of us is imperfect. It's impossible. And it's impossible for pastors as well. Like baseball, life learns us this. It teaches us that we're all a hot mess. We all have something going on at some point in our life. And I don't know anybody that knew that better than Diane. She learned this rigorous truth. You know, you could learn it from the commissioner of baseball, or you could learn it from Diane. Through centuries, saints and sages have spoken this truth until we have this re recurring spiritual theme that has emerged, and it's timeless, and it's, a, it's appropriate for all of us. And uh, let's just call that recurring spiritual truth, the spirituality of imperfection. We're all imperfect. 
And that spirituality is thousands of years old and yet timeless, played out in all of our lives, as I said. Concern with what in every human being is irrevocable and immutable, our essential imperfection, the basic and inherent flaws of being human. To deny our imperfection is to deny self, to be human, is to embody this particular paradox. For according to the ancients and according to Faye Vincent, and very well understood by Diane, we are all of us less than God, and we are all of us more than beasts, and yet somehow we're both. All of our life, we are not everything, but we're not nothing. Or as Luther used to put it, we are simul uses at the cotter, we are simultaneously saints and sinners. All of us. Churchill said this. Churchill said that many of us stumble upon the truth about ourselves, our essential imperfection, at least once in a while along the long way of life. Sooner or later we all stumble upon that particular truth. And Churchill said most of us just pick ourselves up and brush off the dust and carry on as if nothing happened. And so we learn absolutely nothing. But those who take stock of our imperfections, they get the wisdom. They actually join the human race. They come to realize we are all in the same boat. We're all schmucks. <laughs> you either own this truth and join the human race or you live a lie. You stand alone, you become self-reliant, and you are deceived. With regard to the lie and the deception, I will give you the paltry wisdom of one American essayist that I least like to quote, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I just will quote him so I have something to argue against. He writes this, we are individuals responsible for our own destiny. With ourselves standing all alone, we have within us all the necessary resources to thrive. We Americans stand most nobly when standing alone. Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Good luck with that. I can't stand Emerson. <laughs> <laughs> and Diane wouldn't have liked what he wrote in the least. I know this because we talked about it. We were made to stand alone within ourselves, having all the resources necessary to thrive. Baloney. Such nonsense, I would argue, has led many a man and woman to madness and despair and all of its corollaries, addiction, depression, loneliness, even suicide. Pity before he wrote his treatise on self-reliance, young Emerson actually didn't have some chance to live a little bit, to get knocked around a little bit, and find out how important it is to have somebody there that will befriend him and love him. Pity he didn't discover until much later in his life, what John Donne discovered centuries before, that no one is an island until himself. No one gets through this blessed and bruised life unscathed. And certainly no one gets through it without more than a little help from a good, good friend. It'd have to be perfect to be on our own. We weren't made for perfection. Too bad Emerson didn't get that. He would have been a better philosopher. <laughs> he would have been a much more decent human being. But Diane got it. Self-reliance and perfection is a sham. Conceived in the heart of the old Adam and Eve, which breathes right down to this very day, in every last one of us, we all bite the apple. All of us. The wise of us, the wisest of us, while never completely able to tame that impulse, at least we recognize it in ourselves. This impulse for perfection, self-reliance. Diane perhaps having glimpsed such childishness in others, but more likely discovering by terrible grace the same fiction in herself. She became tipped on principle, away from the lie of perfect perfection and the sham of self-reliance. She began, became tipped toward the truth of life, 
that one can only discover with a band of sisters and brothers who understand themselves to be just like all of us here, human warts and all. Do you know how breathtaking that is to find somebody like that? Of course you do. That's why you're here. She won you over. We happy few, and we band of brothers and sisters. For she today who bleeds with me shall be my sister always. Diane bled with us. And people this night now abed shall think themselves a curse. They were not here and told the truth about their humanity deep and honest because they had not, not joined in the struggle alongside others, other people like you and I who know that we're imperfect. We in the church, we speak often of a unity that is ours because God in Christ has accomplished something for us that we could never do for ourselves. Namely, make us God's beloved children, and he keeps us forever. And so St. Paul wrote, as Jim read, Not even death can separate us from the love of God in Christ our Lord. We are saved by God's grace, period. God doesn't need our assistance. God doesn't need our approval or our decision or our permission. We bring absolutely nothing to the table. We have heard this. And it has created in us a faith. We take it to heart, and therefore we are one together, not in our goodness, but because of God's grace. We're all in the same boat. Diane got this. United we are, knowing that no one of us got here because of some perfection in ourselves, but by grace we're forgiven. Sinners are right in band of brothers and sisters. Forgive. But just as importantly as that, as we remember Diane today, among all those who have understood how this life of ours is finally bestowed by grace, we must recognize also how we are also one in our imperfection. We're all one in our fear. We're united in our failure. We are the same in our foibles and our disappointments and our shame and our unbelief and our arrogance and our selfishness. We're all in the same boat. We all stand before Christ's cross on level ground. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it like this. He talked about the church. He said, the final breakthrough to real fellowship among Christians often does not occur because though we have fellowship with one another as believers and as devout people, we do not have fellowship as the undevout and sinners. He writes, the pious fellowship permits no one to be a sinner, so everybody must conceal his sin from himself and from the fellowship. We dare not be honest. We feign perfection. We put on our Sunday fast. I can't think of anything more fraudulent. Many Christians, Bonhoeffer writes, are unthinkably horrified when a real sinner is suddenly discovered among the righteous. So we remain alone, living in lies of hypocrisy. We're a mess. And that's just the facts. Uh, some actually get this, and I, Diane did. Diane did. And it was life for me to be with her. Emerson never got it. <laughs> but boy, your Diane sure did. If you had to spend a year on a deserted island with one other human being and you could choose between two, would you choose Emerson or Diane? I'll take Diane all day long. All day long. Because we're always on level ground. She would let me come in and sit down and she would talk to me just like Paul. Diane the Wise. I shall remember her now as Diane the Wise, the best friend anyone could ever want, the most loving mom, a son or daughter could ever hope for because she knew herself as imperfection, a sinner in need of God's grace, because she always met you eye to eye, because she dared to be Diane, the real McCoy, and she allowed you to dare to be you. 
So often our electronic sign out on Western Avenue. We put up this sign lately, and this is what it says. Worship for the wobbly-legged and the weak meat. Worship for those who feel like their cheese is falling off the cracker. <laughs> Worship for, for the majority. This is hard to read, driving by in a car, but it's still good. That's just for people walking by. Worship for the bedraggled, beat up, and burnt out. Worship for the bent and bruised who feel like their lives have been a disappointment. No one is unwelcome. There is a place here at the table for you. It's a crazy kind of thing to put on a sign up on the front of a church. These days when the few folks who are still looking for a little truth from the church are only always looking for the next big thing, the hottest, brightest, hippest, shiniest, most entertaining thing where everyone's smart and cheery and good looking and prosperous and perfect. How dare we display such a message on our electronic sign? I will tell you why. Because it's honest. Because Jesus, in whom we're baptized and through whom we have the forgiveness of sins, allows that kind of honesty among us. Think about all the people of God that Christ, in his incarnation, dared to dwell with and to eat with. Rarely, as far as I can see in Scripture, did he dine with the beautiful and rich and powerful and the perfect. He ate with them at all. They sure didn't want to eat with him. But Jesus ate with the scalawags and the outcasts and the sinners. And all the guys with bad haircuts. <laughs> uh, so we put those kinds of statements on our electronic sign, frankly, because you, if you come into this place on any Sunday, you'll find yourself kneeling at table next to someone who is a lot like your Diane. So beautiful, because she was real and honest, and she was such an easy friend, and so opening, open and loving to neighbor, because she knew herself to be imperfect, like all the rest of us. Had nothing to boast about but Christ, and was really glad to welcome anybody with her empty hands and her grateful heart uh, that might have just wandered in you know, anytime. Truly anyone. Even you. You know, I mean, I mean, this kind of wisdom takes a lot. Will you, I, I fear I, I've gone a little long here. Can, will you indulge me just one more moment? I, <laughs> this kind of wisdom takes time. It's forged in the crucible of life with a few fearless self-inventories thrown in along the way to help us be honest, to help us tell the truth about who it is that we have become, who we have failed to become, to be truthful about what we have done and what we have failed to do. And it's, and it's best done with a group of a band of brothers and sisters who understand themselves as imperfect. Nobody wants to hear these kinds of things about ourselves. And so in addition to sitting with friends and doing this, it requires patience, a lot of forgiveness. I think we have to learn to forgive ourselves. It's going to take a lot of humor. Diane had a great sense of humor. She even laughed at my jokes. And any blessed scalaway you'll ever find kneeling around Christ's table will tell you this too. There's little wisdom to be gotten in this life standing all by yourself, self-reliant. We're in this together. And so I say thank you, dear friend. Diane said thank you to me so many times going out of church on Sunday morning. She never said thank you, you need a haircut. She said thank you. She looked me square in the eye so there was no missing the meaning. Never ever was there a more kindly greeting than hers. You will all agree with that. Anybody who has ever greeted by Diane, she was never superior, always met you eye to eye and level ground. She kept it real. She made you feel safe.
How did she step through this doorway into whatever this wisdom? How did that happen? It probably wanted or not. It came by way of some awareness of her own faults and foibles. Uh, the specks and logs she discovered looking in her own eyes. And seeing those, she was allowed to give others the benefit of the doubt and look away from the, spe the specks and the logs that were in their eyes. I do know this. Folks who know themselves to be imperfect, they tend to be a lot less critical of others, a lot more open to others. They're a lot more fun to be around than those who don't understand themselves like that. So in our commendation, just before we leave the sanctuary this morning, we will say these words. We will commend Diane into God's care. We will say, into your hands, Lord, we commend your servant. Diane, acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Diane, I'm certain, would nod and smile to all of that. Or maybe another way of looking at it. Perhaps it was that Diane, who died on Monday, also understood herself to have already died some time before. In baptism, we die to self, to ego. St. Paul says we die to Christ in order to live to God and to others. People who insist on their own life, on their own terms, who refuse to die to self, they don't have much time for others. They bring agendas when they meet with you. They rarely listen to you. And when they speak, their words are full of self. They say things like, I'm right. You're wrong. They're just not a lot of fun. But dying people speak resurrection words. The kind of words that make their way into your heart and make you want to change, be better. <clears throat> Dying people say res resurrection words. They take time for others, especially the least and the last and the lonely, the outcasts. You and I need people like that in our lives, don't we? We do. How good it was to have Diane in our arms. Wow. But then, of course, that's also why we're hurting so much this morning. Because Diane befriended us and because she loved us unconditionally and because she dared to be real in whose presence we could dare to be real there is really a lot of risk in all of this it is the risk of love it's the risk of love and that risk it always ends like this it always ends in grief you know, we miss these people now and we will weep it always ends in grief, but what are you going to do? Become self-reliant? Stop risking love? Live alone on an island? I say no. Let's dare risk love again. Dare to be honest with each other always. Let's dare to speak of God as our only hope and our only Savior. Let's dare to be ourselves, worth and all. Let's dare to live with each other, not just as saints, maybe not even especially as saints, but as honest sinners. Let's dare to be real. Let's dare to tell the truth and to live it, because God smiles on that kind of honesty. And you know who else will smile on all of that? Let's say her name. Diane.
Let's make affirmation of faith together where we will use the Apostle Paul's words. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? The hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. Know that all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come at this moment of sorrow to submit our way to your divine and mysterious will. You have said in your word, if we ask, it shall be given. If we seek, we shall find. If we knock, doors will be opened. We come now to ask that you give us strength to release Diane back to you in a spirit of gratitude, knowing that there will be no more suffering, no more heartaches, no more tears. Help us to rejoice that there is rest from all labor. There is peace that passes all understanding. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is the great. Gracious God, as human flesh, you became in Jesus, who was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. In the wake of Diane's passing, we have become acquainted with grief. And so to you we pour out the whole torrent of feelings unleashed by this loss. Let your Holy Spirit search our hearts, sharing our pain with sighs too deep for words. We ask that you would provide the strength and support we need when we are too weak and broken to take another step. And that through what we are now suffering, we would feel your sustaining presence that we might say, surely the Lord God is in this place. Hear us, O oh God. Lord, we seek greater faith. Dispel our doubts and fears. Help our unbelief. Renew our trust in you that by the power of your love we shall one day be brought together again with our beloved Diane. Hear us, O oh God. And now, as our sister stands knocking at the door of eternal life, may we be reminded of the light you promise us, that we may soon rise from our sorrow and be about the unfinished business that is before us. Teach us the fine arts of gratitude and kindness and humility and forgiveness and joy, that the remainder of our journey may not hinder or in any way be to us a burden. As we command Diane's life and spirit into your hands, we command ours as well. We ask all of this in, in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Hear these words. As we prepare for communion, Jesus has said this. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples. He said this, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For mine is the kingdom. Uh, and glory for the river. Now we will have communion together. And we will give you the bread, the wine, the body and blood. How it is the body and blood is in the street, but this is what Jesus promises. And uh, and this table is for all of you. I want to be really clear about this. All are welcome at Jesus' table, so all come. The ushers will lead you forward to receive the sacrament. And we'll be <coughs>
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this healing power of this gift of life, and we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let us commend Diane to the mercy of God. With your hands, O oh merciful Savior, we commend your beloved Diane. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Depart from Christian soul in peace. In the name of God, the Creator, who formed you. In the name of Jesus Christ, who redeemed you. In the name of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, who sanctifies you. In communion with the saints and all the heavenly hosts. And he rests in peace and dwell forever with the Lord. Amen. And now may God, who brought us to birth and in whose arms we die. In our sorrow and grief, may God contain and comfort us, give us hope in our hurting and grace to let go into a new life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let us go forth in peace. <laughs>